from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Books and Beyond program for today. I'm Guy Lamolinar from the Center for the Book, and for those of you who don't know about us, we are the Reading Promotion Office here at the Library of Congress, and we have affiliated centers for the book in every state, the District of Columbia, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. You can also find us on the web at read.gov, and we have a Facebook page that's dedicated to this author series where you can look at webcasts of our previous Books and Beyond programs and you can enter into discussions with other people about the Books and Beyond programs. Um, one thing I need to tell you is that we're webcasting today, so if you ask a question at the end of the program, you'll be a part of the webcast. Also, I need to let you know that could you please turn off all electronic devices. I'm pleased today to welcome Garrett Peck to our Books and Beyond author series. Garrett is a self-described literary journalist, but not only is he that, he's also, as he says, a craft beer drinking, wine collecting, gin loving, bourbon sipping, Simpsons quoting dork. So you can see that Garrett's very well qualified to be here today to talk about the subject of prohibition. He is the author of one book called The Prohibition Hangover, and he leads the temperance tour of prohibition-related sites here in Washington, D.C. This is his second book, uh, which he'll be discussing today, and it will be for sale here after the presentation, and Garrett will be signing it as well. And it's called Prohibition in Washington, D.C., How Dry We Weren't. Please welcome Garrett Peck. Thanks to everyone here for coming out here today and for hopefully not sacrificing your lunch hour, but hopefully we'll get an enjoyable talk about, uh, about prohibition in D.C. And, and basically how to, to see how much the nation's capital was expected to be this model dry city for the country during the, uh, as H.L. Mencken called it, the 13 awful years of prohibition. And then ultimately how prohibition unraveled. And of course what happened here in Washington, D.C. really had national ramifications because the spotlight was on the city. It was expected to be the dry city. And in fact, we ended up having 3,000 speakeasies across the city. We didn't quite have the same big club scene like New York City had in other cities, but certainly there was a great deal of law breaking going on, including within the halls of Congress. Congress had its own bootleggers at that time. So it's really, really a remarkable story and one that hasn't been told yet. Uh, the research itself I, I did, it's almost entirely primary research. So it's really getting back into memoirs, biographies, um, finding original pictures, um, and original newspaper accounts. And so really just dove deeply into the archives. And I really wanted to give a plug here for the, the prints and photographs division here at the Library of Congress. We include it in the book here. Um, by the way, the, the cover for image here is actually based on two photographs from, they come out of the archives right here in the Library of Congress. Uh, the one on the right, you'll, you, and you'll see both of these here. And then the, 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 the wine bottle images actually come out of the Woodrow Wilson house, and, and I took that, that particular photo. We included in the book 80 different images, and about half of those came from the Library of Congress. So really, really significant. We have a treasure trove, or, or as one person said, this is really like our attic. And you keep digging further and further, and you keep finding these amazing things. You have an incredible Prohibition era uh, uh, archive here in the Library of Congress. And what I discovered when I was going through this, I, I'm very fortunate, I live in Arlington, so if I need anything, I can just run over here and get something, right? What about researchers who live outside of the city? This is where digitization really comes in handy. And the vast majority of these images, I was able to download. So really, really tremendous. I only had to come in for two, two images which are important for the unraveling of prohibition. I'll point out to both of those, one was already scanned but not put online, and the other one just hadn't been scanned at all yet. And I dug through the archives and I found it, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to include it. I felt like, you know, finding the source of the Nile or something, you know. So, so really, it's, it's an incredible treasure trove that we have right here in the Prints and Photographs Division. We also included here with this book, besides the 80 images, we also included 11 vintage cocktail recipes. So for those of you guys who, who like cocktails, uh, nine of those are specific to D.C., and two of those are, the other two are specific to the Prohibition era. And then finally, we also included five different neighborhood maps. And this is the Capitol Hill map uh, 
So we, we wanted to show where all the mayhem occurred across the city so you could actually get out there. It's a 40,000 word book, so you could take it in your hand, put it in your pocket, take it with you and go see some of these different sites across the city, including right here on Capitol Hill. So if you want to get out in your lunch hour and go see a couple of sites, then you know it's all available here, right here for you. All right, as Guy mentioned, I lead a tour called the Temperance Tour, which I, I largely lead it through Walkingtown, DC, which is our, our uh, free tour, uh, free tours that we give uh, twice a year. Then I give it as well a, a couple other times. But believe it or not, we actually have a temperance fountain here in Washington, D.C. Most of them have been ripped out, but we still have ours. It's right across in the archives. So that's where we start the tour. Um, we go to uh, Calvary Baptist Church, where the anti saloon League had its first national convention in 1895. And we end up at the Woodrow Wilson House, which was, uh, Wilson was the only president to retire to Washington, D.C. He lived at this house here less than three years before he died. Um, and they have, as you see from the wine bottles here, a Prohibition era wine cellar, which is very rare. Those are all original bottles. Pretty, pretty significant. So who here saw the Ken Burns series? Very good, so about half the room. And how many of you have it on your tape or you've already bought the DVD and you're gonna watch it? Very cool, despite everyone else, so <laughs> really cool. So how did we get into the mess of prohibition? You know, we changed the constitution to ban alcohol in American society. And less than 14 years later, we changed the constitution back because it failed horribly. So, but how did we get into this? We, we have forgotten about this altogether, but the key word here is written across the screen here, and this is a, a photograph, the, the lower two photographs, from the great, great Hall right across the street, and that's the word temperance. We had a century-long social reform movement in the United States called the temperance movement. It, it's one of those funny words like the gold standard or anarchy or communism. It just isn't really part of our, our cultural vocabulary anymore. But for a century, this movement, led largely by evangelical white Protestants, it really stigmatized alcohol within the United States and ultimately led to the 18th Amendment, which banned the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcohol in the country. Yeah, you think that's kind of extreme. I mean, we're banning a consumer product that Americans had always drank and always enjoyed. But when you think where the roots of the temperance movement came from was a huge whiskey binge that took place by the 1820s. And as a result, these churches rose up and said, we've got to do something about this problem. A century later, they decided changing the Constitution was the way to go. And if we basically dry up the country, then we'll have a more godlike, God-fearing country, and uh, we'll have more middle-class sobriety and, and so on. It didn't quite turn out that way. Um, a lot of unintended consequences throughout it all. One thing I did want to point out was Francis Willard. This is in Statuary Hall, by the way. Has anybody ever seen this photo or seen the statue? A number of people have. This is, Frances Willard was a hugely important woman here for the 19th century. Um, she led the Women's Christian Temperance Union for about 20 years, and she was the first woman to get a statue in Statuary Hall, placed there by the state of Illinois. And the WCTU basically linked their cause together with the women's suffrage movement. The suffrage movement was actually much smaller than the, than the WCTU, and therefore they linked their two causes together. That way they could each get their, their goal. And as a result, you see both the 18th Amendment, which banned alcohol, and the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote, both went in effect in 1920. That is not a coincidence at all. It's because they had this alliance. And what happens though, of course, in the 1920s, once it's illegal for everyone to drink, well now it's equally illegal for women to drink. And they decide that they're gonna be equal in breaking the law. Right, so women in the 1920s start going to the speakeasies and they start smoking cigarettes. It's this huge era of social change in the 1920s. It, it is their, the era, after all, of Sigmund Freud and consumerism is really starting to write and also probably the country's first sexual revolution takes place in the 1920s. The real person who gets the 18th Amendment passed um, and put a huge amount of pressure upon the country is this man, Wayne Wheeler. Has everybody heard of Wayne Wheeler? If you watch the Prohibition series, they talked about him quite a bit. He was a hugely powerful, powerful person of, of his time. I, I like to hearken him, possibly compare him to Karl Rove or Grover Norquist for the power that he had over the politicians. And with, in his case, uh, he basically came up with the term pressure politics. He figured out how to squeeze the politicians to force them to vote dry. Even if they were wet in their personal lives, he didn't really care, but he wanted to force them to vote dry. And he figured out the way of how uh, first going after the states uh, to allow local option laws, 
And then once local option laws were in place at the county level, then the state gradually would dry up, and then that would force the congressmen and the senators to, to go dry as well, and to vote, most importantly, to, to vote dry. And so a hugely uh, influential, influential person. The ASL was actually headquartered uh, just outside of, of Columbus, Ohio, but Wheeler had his office, if you know where um, Robert A. Taft Memorial Park is, that's where his office was. There was a building there called the Bliss Building, and which was ripped down, I think, in the 1950s when they created the park. But so basically right across the street from the Senate. Right? So really, really, really important place. He also had some key allies. Um, again, this was a, an evangelical Protestant-led mission, mo sorry, movement, a faith-based initiative. Do you all recognize this building? This is the Methodist Building. Yeah, Anne got it. <laughs> The Methodist Building, and I'm, I took this photo, by the way, from the Supreme Court, which was built in 1935. So this building, if you go stand at the front of the Methodist Building, it points right to the dome of the Capitol, because it's right there at the corner of Maryland and First Street. Um, the point is, and, and uh, by the way, that's in the background, you can see the Russell uh, Senate Office Building, and then right next to it was where Wayne Wheeler's office was. So you can imagine, one block here of the Methodists, right around the corner is where the anti saloon League has, has its headquarters. So they really put the squeeze on Congress. And this building, by the way, was built in 1923. So the point was to remind Congress, this is the law of the land, and you are required to, to enforce it. Not that Congress or the presidency actually did a great deal of enforcement, um, but that's another story. This photo here we, we used on the cover of the book, and I think it's one of the most clever Prohibition era photos that, that we found. It uh, shows William Upshaw, who's one of the key and probably one of the few congressmen who actually was dry in both voting and, in, and in, in his personal life. And of course, he's holding an umbrella over the Capitol to basically signify that the Capitol and the White House and Congress is hereby now dry. So <laughs> this photograph was taken in 1926. And then he ran for the presidency. He was a Democrat, but he ran in 1932 against Roosevelt um, as the Prohibition Party candidate. And he was not elected. Roosevelt was instead. <laughs> At that point, of course, prohibition was really coming undone. This photo here, uh, this is the one photo I'll show you here that, uh, that's black and white that did not come out of, uh, uh, out of the Princeton Photographs Division. This actually came from the H.L. Mencken Estate. Uh, but I love this quote. I, I found a cocktail recipe um, in his memoirs, which were published in 1992. Um, and it was called the Coffin Varnish from a bar that he found up in New York City. <laughs> yeah, the coffin varnish. It's a boozy little number. And with, when he's describing this cocktail, he said, at the start of the 13 awful years in capitalized letters. So very, very clearly, he, he was a, a, a wonderful Greek and very acerbic Greek chorus uh, about prohibition. Um, didn't think too highly of the movement. And, and really saw through the temperance movement for, for what it was, which was this was this faith-based initiative, and it was trying to essentially impose a vision of middle class sobriety upon the country that had always been a drinking country in the past, right? So Mencken did everything he could in his writing power to undermine prohibition. Probably about half of my research time was investigating one single question, which, had, which I've never seen written on before, which was, what was the African American experience during prohibition? What did black people think about prohibition? And I discovered that this was actually a very difficult topic to go research. It really took a great deal of digging into the archives. And predominantly, I ended up using the, the Black Studies Center over at um, the Martin Luther King Library, um, because they have all kinds of newspapers on microform. None of it's digitized, unfortunately. Um, but at the time, I, I really, really discovered that DC was so, because we're a southern city, was, and we had Jim Crow law here. So the Washington Post, we had four big newspapers, all, I should say, four big white newspapers. They would not cover black issues. They would, they would only mention black people if they were arrested. And so I really wanted to cover this other side of the story because we know during Prohibition that U Street boomed, right? We know that there were all these jazz clubs. Wherever there was jazz, there was cocktails, right? We know all these things go hand in hand. So I really wanted to get to the bottom of what was the African American experience here during Prohibition. And so I, I found a couple of different thought leaders within the black community who wrote about the temperance movement and prohibition. One of the leaders was Calvin Chase from the Washington Bee, who unfortunately died in 1922. Um, but I, I got the name of the chapter that deals with the black community, and I, I call it the Jim Crow Annex, from this one quote, which he said, why should the colored people ally themselves with a white temperance organization as a Jim Crow Annex? I mean, he really saw through the temperance movement for what it was, which was, you're trying to impose this upon, upon my people, 
and we don't want that, right? So he really strongly <laughs> pushed against the temperance movement in all of his writings. And that picture, by the way, which comes out of the archives here, um, was his office. If you know where that restaurant Agüen is, so right north of where the former, it's not a huge pit in the ground, where the old convention center was, so right across the street from there. It was torn down, I think, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, but that's where he wrote the newspaper and his family lived in that building and it was all torn down. It's, it's over on I Street. Other things we lost here in Washington, D.C. We lost our major, by the way, before Prohibition started, we had 247 uh, bars here licensed in the city. And of course, ostensibly, once Prohibition begins, we have zero, but we ended up with 3,000 speakeasies. <laughs> so, sort of unintended consequences once you deal away with regulation and licensing and so on. And it becomes just simply a business opportunity for a lot of people. We had a one block row in the city called Rum Row. That was the finest place in the city. It was one bar, one restaurant after the next where you could go to drink. And the most famous of all the bars was nicknamed Cobweb Hall, but its official name was Shoemakers. And this was closed down in, DC actually went dry on November 1st, 1917 um, by Congress. Congress mandated that the city had to go dry. We didn't have home rule at the time. And so Shoemakers uh, tried to make it for a couple more months as a soft drink joint, and people didn't want soft drinks. They wanted beer, they wanted cocktails. So Shoemakers unfortunately went out of business. The important thing about Shoemakers wasn't just that, okay, every president except for Rutherford B. Hayes from when the place opened up in 1858 all the way to when it closed in 1917, every president drank there. All the politicians drank there. Mark Twain drank there. This was a hugely historic site. And by the way, it's now where the J.W. Marriott Hotel is. Um, what happened in this bar here in the 1880s was that the Ricky was invented. And uh, I worked with Derek Brown from the DC Craft Bartenders Guild and we got the city council to give us a pro proclamation back in July declaring that the Ricky is now DC's official, or sorry, our native cocktail. And because the, the, the guild has had a, a, a Ricky month for the last four years. So um, we use the book actually as documentation to prove the provenance of the Ricky. So it's, it's the one cocktail we can certifiably uh, established that in fact it was invented at Shoemakers in the 1880s. So it's a great little part of our, of our local history. There's only two cities, by the way, that have an official cocktail, uh, the other one being New Orleans. And can you guess what that cocktail is? No. <laughs> it's Sazerac. It's the Sazerac. <laughs> yeah, the, the Sazerac is, in, sorry, the hurricane has several different origin stories, including most likely Wisconsin, strangely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the Sazerac, as we know, in fact, was invented. <laughs> We also lost, because of Prohibition, a significant brewing culture we had in this city. We had four big breweries in the city. Today, just starting last year, we have now three uh, breweries. Uh, sorry, sorry, this year, um, the first brewery opened up. These are microbreweries, so very, very small. The four breweries that we had before were significant enterprises. Brewing was the second largest employer in Washington, D.C. after the federal government, so really significant. And on Capitol Hill, there were, sorry, the, the four breweries, two were in Foggy Bottom, and two were on Capitol Hill. So where the, um, on, on Capitol Hill itself, the brewers were the second largest employer after the Navy Yard. So pretty remarkable how many people worked in brewing at the time. You know, we had this big German culture, uh, German population here <coughs> within the city. And of course, that's what Germans brought us. It was the great gift the Germans brought the, the American people was lager beer. And you know how hot and sticky our summers are. Before you had air conditioning and starting in the 1920s, how do you think people survived? They drank big Rickies and they drank beer, you know? <laughs> so this particular footage here, um, which you can guess where it comes from, this was the largest brewery we had in the city, which was the Christian Heyrich Brewing Company. It's now the site of the Kennedy Center. And this closed in 1956. It, took, it was all built of steel reinforced concrete. It took three days of dynamite to knock the thing over. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll show you two different pictures of the breweries here on Capitol Hill. This is the National Capital Brewery and uh, another pretty large brewery took up an entire city block. And some of you, who here lives on Capitol Hill? Anyone? A few people. Um, I assume some of you have probably gone shopping at Safeway. That's where the brewery was. It existed until the 1960s. It was an ice cream factory. And then they knocked it over and that's where the Safeway is now on 14th Street. Even closer was this brewery. This is Washington Brewery. And that uh, is, was, uh, was knocked over in the 1920s to form Stuart Hobson Junior High. 
So also quite a large facility. If you walk around that thing, it's an entire city block. So pretty, pretty large. Uh, the new breweries that are opening up are, you know, a fraction of these size because they're microbreweries. But these were designed to uh, produce, you know, half a million barrels of, of, of beer a year because we had such high demand here to drink beer here in the nation's capital. In my research, I found, um, as you as all probably know, there's two big novels that come out of the 1920s, one being The Great Gatsby, right? You know, you all know the story about, about Gatsby, which is really George Remus, the, a larger-than-life bootlegger. The other big novel that comes out of the 1920s is by Sinclair Lewis, and that's called Babbitt, which is a much larger book. And in my research, I found this incredible quote, which he wrote in 1922, by the way. Um, and he gets the Nobel Prize for this in 1930 for this novel. And it sort of skewers, uh, it's a satire, satirical novel, and it skewers Midwestern values of the 1920s. So, and I found, just to give you the setup, what happens in the scene, George Babbitt, the, the hero, is riding on a train with four or five, six other men. And one of them breaks out a flask of gin, and he passes it around to, to the other people. And the guy who brought the bottle of gin um, asks this question, or makes more of a statement. I don't know how you fellows feel about prohibition, but the way it strikes me is that it's a mighty ben beneficial thing for the poor Zob that hasn't got any willpower. But for fellows like us, it's an infringement of personal liberty. This is 1922, he pens this. You, you see right here, this is why prohibition is going to fail because every person says prohibition is for someone else to obey, but not me. I like my cocktail and I'm not giving it up, right? That's not how laws work, you know? <laughs> Especially the, con the law of the land, the constitution, you know? But everyone decides that, no, no, I'm not gonna obey it. And Sinclair Lewis was right on with this. The general public initially was sort of, hmm, wait and see, but pretty soon they realized, you know what? I kind of miss having my cocktail, so. And it turns out that there were bootleggers everywhere already. and. All you got to do is just ask, and you could, you know, you could get your 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 bathtub gin or your, your rye whiskey and so on. So really remarkable here. By the way, he wrote this um, on 19th Street in Dupont Circle, so about half a block up from that restaurant Raku. Um, there's a house where, where he wrote that where he wrote Babbitt in the 1920s. He also wrote Main Street in Washington D.C. in the 19 teens. So prohibition begins. This is one of the most famous images of Prohibition. They included this one in the Ken Burns series. And of course, this took place on Pennsylvania Avenue, um, uh, Northwest. So this took place actually where the Federal Triangle is now. Um, this was Carl, the Carl Hamill Buffet Lunch, which was formerly a bar, but he converted it into a lunchroom during Prohibition, but seemed to keep the little dark room in the back. So people just had to kind of know someone, and they could be invited back and get a drink. So the Prohibition Bureau agents are raiding the place here and pulling out all the beer barrels, because he was a German. Right, so uh, it's, uh, he was raided numerous times here during Prohibition. He didn't ever quite want to shut down. I think it was worth for him just to pay the fines or risk the jail, jail time because that's what his customers wanted, right? They still wanted a drink. Another famous photo from Prohibition, from the largest steel in captivity, the largest steel that was found in Washington, D.C. So this is quite a large steel here, by the way. So. Um, and by the way, we're, we have two gentlemen here who are next year going to be opening up Washington, D.C.'s first distillery since Lord knows when. <laughs> and uh, you'll see most stills that people had in their houses were a fraction of the size, might you know, produce a gallon a day. This is a pretty sizable still here. You, you could produce an awful lot of corn, uh, corn liquor here, corn juice, with this particular still. The amazing thing with Prohibition in Washington, D.C. is we, we didn't have the organized crime like Cleveland, like New York, like Boston, other cities did. We had too many different police jurisdictions. Um, you could never bribe all the different authorities and so on. If you think about, okay, we got the Capitol Police, we got the National Park Service Police, we have the, the uh, Washington Metropolitan Police Department, we have the Secret Service, you, and on top of that we had the Prohibition Bureau. You, you can't bribe everyone, right? <laughs> And as a result, we ended up not getting the organized crime, the mafia, the Irish mob, and so on that other major cities had. As a result, we, the, and there were, the, by the way, there was plenty of lawbreaking going on, but it was largely low-level bootleggers. This was a scene dominated by amateurs. If you wanted to get in on the game, you could. That's the really the remarkable thing. And of course, thousands of people did get involved here in, in, in breaking prohibition, in violating prohibition, just because there was so much money to be made. There was also very little violence in the city be because we did not have the turf wars that other major cities had. Um, therefore, uh, there wasn't necessarily all the shootouts and things that took place. Um, the most famous uh, execution that took place was the St. Valentine's Day Massacre 
um, in 1929, right? And that would take place in Chicago. So nationwide news, and that helped really turn the public against prohibition when people realized this thing wasn't working and that organized crime was taking over the cities. Um, one of the few examples, though, where violence actually did play, take place was this man right here. This was Senator Green who, uh, from Vermont, and he happened to be walking uh, up, the, up Pennsylvania Avenue to get back to the Driscoll Hotel, which was right next to the Bliss Building at the time, where the anti saloon League was. Uh, up an alleyway, there was a bootlegger, a couple bootleggers who were unloading their car, and a Prohibition Bureau agent um, uh, surprised them. They all started exchanging shots, and the, the Prohibition Bureau agent uh, missed the, the, uh, the bootleggers, and that wild shot went down to Pennsylvania Avenue and hit Senator Green in the head, and he happened to just be walking down the street. Yeah, um, it wounded him severely from this, and he ended up dying from it about six years later, but he never ever fully recovered from this. So this is one of the few examples here of, of violence actually taking place here across the city. So, Brock, did you have a question? Oh, no. No? Okay, you're your hand up, so. <laughs> I talked about women being involved in prohibition. They were involved in getting prohibition passed. And of course, once prohibition takes place, it's not the law of the land. Women are all active violators of, of dry law here within the country. And this is a very famous photograph here from, from prohibition from a dancer who came to Washington, DC, I think around 1925, 1926. And here she's demonstrating the latest fashion of how you carry your hip flask with you and your garter belt, right? <laughs> I included this together. This is an image that we included on the cover along with the image of, of uh, Congressman Upshaw. Um, the word scofflaw was invented in 1924 20, based on a national competition to come up with a word to label those lawbreakers. <laughs> and the winners of the contest was scofflaw, somebody who scoffs at the law. One week later, in Harry's Bar in Paris, the scofflaw cocktail is invented. And if you've never had this cocktail, if you like cocktails, this is absolutely delicious. It's a really good cocktail. But this comes from January of 1924. A famous case happened here in Washington, D.C. on in the Navy Yard, where two different Navy nurses were arrested for bootlegging. And what happened within the Navy beforehand, um, the, the, the standard protocol within the Navy, the Navy was if you were caught um, with liquor in your luggage, the standard thing was simply just to confiscate the liquor, but they wouldn't ever bring anyone up on charges. These two nurses were transferred from Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, up to the Navy Yard, and um, Customs found a whole bunch of liquor in their uh, suitcases when they, were, when they were moving up. So the, Depart the Secretary of the Navy ordered them court-martialed. Of course, the officer corps of the Navy was absolutely incensed over this. It was like, we've never court-martialed anyone over this, and, you know, hell if we're going to court-martial anyone now. So they were required to basically put them on trial, but it was sort of a foregone conclusion that they, were, that they were going to be found innocent. The two nurses simply pleaded, these were gifts. People gave them to us. We didn't know what they were. We just put them in our luggage and, you know, yeah. And that's all they had to say, right? And, you know, just have plausible deniability, you know. So <laughs> there was, you know, one afternoon trial. Um, the Washington Post uh, reported, and this is a, a paraphrase, um, that effectively it was a good time was had by all except for the accused. You know? <laughs> but I mean, they were acquitted at the, at the end of this. <laughs> one of the interesting stories and probably one of the, the leading things that took place in the city, uh, this took place in 1929, um, was the largest liquor ring the city was busted up in 1929. This was led by this man. His name was Herbie Glassman or Herbert Glassman. Um, Glassman became a major developer within Washington, D.C. He didn't stay very long in jail at all, but he was running about a 10, 12-person operation out of this rental car agency. It was the perfect front. All he had to do was he got his liquor largely from Baltimore, so he had all these trucks that would basically truck it down the parkway into the city every day, and then he had the rental car agency garage, and then he could distribute it from there. So perfect front, right? He was cited for bravery. In uh, July 1919, we had a huge race riot in the city. It lasted four days. He was a Metropolitan Police Department officer who then left shortly after this and, uh, and decided to uh, open up this agency and become a, a bootlegger. <laughs> so really a fascinating character. I, I was contacted, and it's, it's, since this book came out about six months ago, I've been contacted by so many people um, who are descendants of the people I wrote about. And you, you think that people... Right, DC has this reputation that people don't stay very long here. Well, I've heard from great-grandchildren of people who were bootleggers who I wrote about. Um, in this case here, Herbie Glassman's great-granddaughter contacted me. She's the editor-in-chief for Capital File magazine. Her, her name is Kate Bennett. 
and she was, I, I sent her over all the articles from the Washington Post about her, about her great grandfather, and she was like, oh my gosh, we need to write a book about this guy, you know, so, <laughs> you know, he, he divorced his wife in the 70s, and, you know, moved to Miami Beach, picked up a much younger woman, and proceeded to have another child, and I mean, just a really kind of crazy story, you know, that this, that this guy had, going from a policeman to becoming the biggest bootlegger in the city to <laughs> becoming a major developer, I mean, all within Washington, D.C., and, you know, largely because of his getting arrested in 1929 for running this liquor ring, you know. <laughs> By the way, he had two different, uh, two different offices. One was over on L Street, and that's been developed into a high-rise. The other one was on 14th Street and U Street, uh, right above U Street. If you know where that restaurant Eatonville is, that's where it was. All right, so the public... By the late 1920s, the public is really souring on the idea of prohibition. Everybody knows that everyone is disobeying the law of the land. We're, we've become this nation of hypocrites, as the, the Ken Burns series called it. And as well, what happened in 1929 in October was that the stock market collapsed and the Great Depression started and suddenly people were like, you know, we could really use these jobs again, you know? When prohibition started in 1920, we lost a quarter million jobs. Now suddenly, 19 30, a quarter million jobs look pretty darn nice, right? I mean, if we can restart the liquor industry again, we can put a lot of people back to work, and by the way, we can tax it. So the man who sponsored uh, D.C. going dry was Senator Moore Shepard from, from Texas, one of the leading progressives and probably one of the few senators who actually was dry. <laughs> and uh, uh, he also had, was the key sponsor behind the 18th Amendment, the Prohibition an am Amendment. And uh, in the run-up to the 1930 midterm congressional election, um, he was challenged repeatedly uh, about, about prohibition, and he said this very, very famous statement, there is as much chance of repealing the 18th Amendment as there is for a hummingbird to fly to the planet Mars with the Washington Monument tied to its tail. So effectively, he's, this is September 1930, he says this, he's laying out the gauntlet to the wet cause, saying, okay, go ahead, you know, like Clint Eastwood, right, make my day, right? <laughs> And boy, how do you do they ever? It's just remarkable what happens here. A couple weeks later, there is a group called, the, a local group called the Crusaders, actually a national group, but there's a local chapter under a man named Rufus Lusk, whose grandson, Rufus Lusk III, provided uh, uh, photos here for me. Um, this guy is a real estate guy. He, and it was a World War I infantry captain. And he figured out basically, we can take all the data from all the police raids on speakeasies and put them on maps. And then we can publish it. And that will show that in fact, Washington DC is anything but this model dry city, right? So he publishes two maps. The first one is based on 1929 data, based on seven months of raids from the Metropolitan Police Department uh, 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 raid data. 934 speakeasies in seven months that were raided where they found liquor. So really remarkable. When this map gets published, it makes nationwide, even international news because it shows the hypocrisy. DC is not this model dry city. In fact, all around the city, there's plenty of speakeasies. It's, liquor is easy to get. 1932, he publishes an updated map based on 1931 information. And uh, this is sort of my, you know, Dr. Lawrence, uh, it was the Dr. Lawrence, I presume, moment. You know, you go down the Nile and you find this one little treasure trove piece, which was I found the 1932 speakeasy map right here in the Prints and Photographs Division. And it's just absolutely amazing to see. And uh, are you guys ready for it? This is it. Dots mark the spot where booze has been bought. Yeah. 1,155 locations where the police and the Prohibition Bureau raided where they found liquor. There were another 600 or so spots that they raided where they didn't find any liquor, either because they'd been tipped off or they managed to destroy it or, you know, they were on the payroll or something, you know. But just remarkable, right? The intention of this, of course, just to remind you, is to embarrass the dry cause, to show that, in fact, D.C. is anything but this model dry city. If you look closely on this, and unfortunately, the, the size we have in the book is really, really small, but if you guys want to go look at the thing, it's just amazing, um, or I can email it to people. Um, it's... Uh, when you look on there, you see where the stars are? Can you see those? Um, and it's sort of the orientation of the map is actually sort of on its side. So True North is actually that way. <laughs> um, the stars are government offices where raids took place. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of bootleggers, including in Congress. <laughs> and then you'll see, if you look closely throughout the map, he was very careful about showing where the different dry cause offices were. For example, the Prohibition Bureau office, uh, which is, if you see Pennsylvania Avenue, it's right below the P in Pennsylvania. 
almost dead center. And you'll see right behind it, two raids, two little dots. Um, the Women's Christian Temperance Union is on there. Of course, it's got a bunch of raids right around there. The anti saloon League, lots of raids. And look around the Methodist building. I mean, you know, it has a bunch of raids as well taking place. So all over the city, there's raids taking place, every neighborhood. There's more of a concentration in certain neighborhoods, um, less so surprising on U Street. And someone mentioned that in a, in a talk that perhaps the, the proprietors in U Street were either better armed or, you know, had better connections with the, uh, with the police and therefore they could get tipped off or something. I, I haven't been able to document that at all. Uh, but certainly a, a great deal of where the African-American community lived at the time was Southwest, uh, Foggy Bottom on the West End, um, part, as well in Georgetown, and of course 7th, 7th Street and 9th Street. And of course you see a great concentration of speakeasy raids that take place there. So again, there are raids taking place throughout the city here. And the intention of this map, again, was really to embarrass the dry cause. This happens in September 1930. Just a couple weeks later, in October of 1930, um, one particular man named, well, I'll, let me ask first off, has anybody ever heard, or who might have worked here in Capitol Hill long enough to remember a restaurant bar <coughs> called The Man in the Green Hat? And a few other people. This was The Man in the Green Hat. Um, this, his name was George Cassidy, and he was a bootlegger for Congress for 10 years. Yeah, he had an office. He worked first on the House side, and they gave him an office in the Cannon House office building. Yeah, and every day he trudged in with a suitcase full of liquor. Back then, you were only searched when you left the building, and congressmen weren't searched at all, so therefore they could take their liquor with them. Um, he was arrested in 1925, and then he shifted over to the Senate side. The Senate gave him an office in the Russell Senate office building, uh, because, as he said, senators were more discreet than congressmen were. <laughs> So, remarkable story. What happens, he is arrested then for the second and final time in February 1930. And in October 1930, he goes public with the story. He's the only bootlegger that I know of who spills the beans. And he did it in, in incredible style. Five front page articles in the Washington Post. So this is a national story. Here's this guy, every other bootlegger is very, very quiet about their story. They get arrested, there's sort of this embarrassment. He goes out and does everything but name names. That's the one thing he doesn't do. But he tells exactly where he bought his booze, how he got it into the Senate and House office buildings, and so on, who his customers were. It's, it's a remarkable story. And the story, the very last article, which dealt with congressional culpability, in other words, where he basically said, look, I admit my guilt, but if I'm guilty, so is virtually every other, every other member of Congress because they were my customers, right? In that article, he said, uh, he, he estimated that, based on his experience dealing with all these congressmen, and by the way, there were other bootleggers as well, but he was really the main one. He estimated that four out of five congressmen and senators drank. So, absolutely embarrassing. This was a huge betrayal here to the dry cause, because the, the, the allies of the anti saloon League was Congress. They had basically been squeezed, you know. The midterm election takes place just a week later. This last article takes place, you know, one week to the day before the midterm election. Right, it was, the Washington Post was very clear about this. They had sided with the wet cause at that point, and they really wanted to, to embarrass uh, the, wet, the, the dry cause. So they published this article, the series, uh, the series of articles. Congress then flips, um, not necessarily because of Cassidy, but largely because of the Great Depression. Um, but as a result, what you see um, up until 1930 was a dry Republican Congress, starting in 19, sorry, beginning of 1931 when the new Congress comes in is a wet Democratic Congress. And now they're very hostile towards prohibition and prohibition starts to come undone. In fact, um, sorry, this is the, this, this, but the, the Cannon House office building where Cassidy worked for five years. <laughs> <laughs> so because of the Great Depression, because of all the endemic law breaking, the idea behind prohibition was to create this dry utopia within the country. But in fact, it turned out to be anything but. You know, if anything, we, we rolled out the red carpet to organize crime and, and to unorganize crime. Um, there was a great deal of violence. There was poisoning of alcohol going on during this era and a general disregard for the law of the land. You know, okay, we changed the Constitution to ban alcohol, but everyone's blowing it off, right? Everyone's manufacturing and selling and transportation, transporting alcohol and buying it and so on. So the, con the country had really decided that they, they didn't want this. And there was this national movement then by the early 1930s to, to end prohibition. And the Democrats are very, very smart in the 1932 uh, uh, presidential election. FDR ran on a platform of repeal. And part of the big promise of that, and repeal became the 21st Amendment, right? 
the big promise was we are going to get everybody back to work. We're going to reestablish uh, uh, the liquor trade, but it's going to be different this time. States will have the power to regulate it, according to the 21st Amendment. Um, and a number of states actually stayed dry, like Oklahoma and Mississippi. Oklahoma stays dry until 1959, and Mississippi until 1966. You know, so it, it, the, the promise is greater regulation and taxation, and we're basically going to get this unregulated beast back under control. So that's really the promise of, of repeal, and the country decides yes, that's absolutely what we want. So on March 1933, this is the last inauguration day that takes place in March. Uh, Herbert Hoover rides in the car together with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. They hardly speak to each other because they had a very vicious uh, uh, campaign. And Hoover is quite bitter about losing, but it was sort of for a foregone conclusion because of the Great Depression that he was going to lose the election. Uh, Roosevelt, in his first two weeks in office, promises to legalize beer, which those of you who come from states where you still see 3-2 beer, 3.2% beer, um, that came about from the waning days of prohibition when Congress simply just declared that 3.2% beer was non-intoxicating and therefore didn't violate the 18th Amendment. And that went into effect on, on April 7th, and so two weeks into Roosevelt's term in office. And uh, the country, I think that's really the, the beginning of the end um, of prohibition. The, f the first state, Michigan, had voted just a couple of days before. And uh, how long do you think it took to get uh, three quarters of the states to vote for prohibition to end? Any guesses? Less than a year. It, it took 13 months for, which is remarkable, 13 months to get prohibition passed. Repeal takes eight months. <laughs> I mean, this was a true national consensus. The country wanted this thing over with really desperately by, by this point. So the first state is Michigan. Any Michiganders here? Woohoo! <laughs> Your state went first on, I think, March 3rd or 4th, sorry, April 3rd or 4th, uh, uh, 1933. So what was the 36th state, the state that put it over the top? Anyone want to guess? Arkansas. Sorry? Arkansas. No, not Arkansas. I heard Utah. it somewhere. It was Utah. Utah was the 36th state. Yeah, the state where 70% 70, 70 of the people are Mormon, right? But the promise that they, that, and the Democrats, by the way, were in firm control of the country at this point. The, the promise they made to their constituents wasn't that, that they're in favor, because most of the delegates, of course, are Mormon, right? Uh, they're not in favor of alcohol, but rather we, we're in favor of law and order. We want to get this thing reestablished, and, and Utah ended up uh, forming a system. A uh, minority of states did this, 18 states formed the system whereby the state itself becomes the, the, retail, the retailer. So we see that in Virginia, where, where I live as well, um, and Montgomery County has that as well. So that was, again, part of the promise of repeal is we're going to have far more regulation than we did before, and the states have far more control over alcohol than they did before prohibition ended. What's remarkable to see, okay, we went through this whole century-long temperance movement. We heavily stigmatized alcohol in the country. We, we ban out the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcohol by putting it into the Constitution. Less than 14 years later, it fails. You fast forward to today, and more than two-thirds of American adults now drink. And that stigma is largely gone in American society. And that's actually the topic of my first book, The Prohibition Hangover. It's a subtle and yet really remarkable social shift. You know, like when I lead the temperance tour and I always ask people, who can define what temperance is? And no one can. You know, a century ago, this was, after, after slavery, after abolitionism, this was the social reform movement. This was, you know, we're going to get make, make us into a sober country. And now, of course, who even remembers that anymore? We remember prohibition, but no one knows how and why we got into this mess, you know, or why it ended so, so quickly here within the country. Uh, this concludes my presentation here today, and I will be glad to an answer any questions you have. So, uh, she had her hand up here first. Can you talk to us about the two men and its involvement with okay. the prohibition? Sure thing. Uh, the question was, uh, can I talk about Tune In and uh, and its role in prohibition? Has everybody here been been to Tune In? Um, I think everyone has. Very cool. So, <laughs> yeah, Tune In is just a couple blocks up up the street here, and it's currently closed, but it's going to reopen. They had a kitchen fire a few months ago. It, during Prohibition, it was a candy store. Um, and it was a speakeasy at the same time. And you think of speakeasies as always being these swanky New York clubs, like the Cotton Club and so on. Well, speakeasies really ran the gamut. Um, it was just simply just a place where you could go buy illegal booze. So this was a candy store. They kept their liquor in the basement of the place. And they, they went in there and asked about it. And they showed me, if, if you go in there for lunch sometime or when it reopens, uh, look right under the, uh, the coffee maker. And there's a little staircase, uh, uh, sorry, a ladder that goes straight down. Um, that's how they brought the liquor up. So if somebody came in, 
they'd ask for you know something if they knew the password <laughs> and they'd wrap it up for them and then bring it up the ladder for them so really kind of remarkable but again a candy store that was also a speakeasy brock you had a question yeah the photograph Mm -hmm. Can you comment on that? Yeah, the, the question was about, about the, the, the raid on the Carl Hamill lunchroom with all the barrels and they're you know, pulling them all out. Um, and was that, that was kind of meant to be a public spectacle, right? It takes place in broad daylight. It's right downtown. Yeah, there was certainly an element of trying to shame the owners. Uh, but very quickly during a prohibition, uh, getting arrested for a prohibition offense turned out to be anything but shameful. If anything, it turned out to be, you know, it added to your, to your street cred. It was, there was a glamour to it, right? You remember the woman, the dancer with the, the hip flask in her garter belt, right? Suddenly disobeying the law becomes glamorous. Like, oh, you're a, you're a bootlegger. Oh, hello, you know, here's my number, you know. It's, <laughs> it, it's remarkable the social change that happens during this point where we suddenly elevate lawbreakers into becoming people that are really cool and so on. So, uh, you and then you? Yes, sir, you had your hand up. Um, you, you mentioned the Woodrow Wilson House uh, in your book, How the, the Joseph and Tokyo uh, and the Current Curator. Uh, did they mention and did you see that wonderful exhibit that they had in 2005, 2006, Woodrow Wilson and uh, the Prohibition Amendment and the Temperance Senate? I, unfortunately, the question was if I had seen the, the um the exhibit that they had the Woodrow Wilson House, uh, no temperance in it, um, back in 2005. Unfortunately, I, I missed that exhibit. I would have loved to have seen it. And Mark Benbow was the director at the, at the time, and he's now the. Was he the curator too? Did he curate that? Uh, I assume he did. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's now actually the director now of the Arlington Historical Society. Yeah. Yes. How long were the sentences usually when they were arrested? How long were the Sentences. Oh, they really varied. I'm oh, sorry. The, the question was how long were the sentences uh, during Prohibition? They really varied. Generally, what happened um, was you, you would get arrested, you'd post bond, you're on the street the next day or even that night, um, and then you reopen the next day and you're the same place. So that was a huge problem during Prohibition that people just all you had to do was call up your bootlegger and resupply you. Um, by about 1925, 26 or so, New York led this wave, which was padlocking, which was if we, if we, um, find that you've, if you're selling booze, well, we're going to put a padlock on the door for a year. And of course, that led then bootleggers and speakeasies simply just to reopen down the street in a different place. I mean, <laughs> there was so much money to be made that people weren't going to give this thing up. Um, and then during Hoover, Herbert Hoover's uh, time in office, he was the only president who really tried to enforce prohibition, which I think helped undermine prohibition even more because people just got sick of the heavy handed enforcement during that time. People were already going into it, were like, What's up with this? We're sick of it, right? And here comes the Prohibition Bureau even more now, right? And they passed the Jones 5 and 10 law, which was five years in prison and $10,000 fine. Not that many people went to jail for that, for that term, but um, yeah, as you see, what, what happens very, very quickly is this totally bogs down the legal system in the country. The court system is absolutely crowded with cases. The smart bootleggers know to, to plead innocent and demand a trial by jury because that's just gonna absolutely just throw cogs on the wheel, right? You know? <laughs> and of course the, the, the jails and so on are absolutely full of, of people. You can't handle the number of people who've been arrested and, and so on. So judges very quickly are trying to get people to plea and because they know they can't put them all in jail. You know? So they're back on the streets very, very quickly. So not that many people actually go to jail for the jo Jones 5 and 10 law, um, although it certainly angered an awful lot of people. Yeah. So uh, Michael, oh, sorry, actually Kevin, you had your hand up first, then we'll go back to Michael. So. You mentioned the 18th and 19th Amendment, how women's suffrage was kind of tied into the prohibition movement. I wanted to say a few words about how income tax uh, was tied into it. Gotcha. The question was how the income tax amendment was tied into the prohibition, uh, the, the temperance movement and the, and the prohibition amendment. Uh, before prohibition, the, the, the U.S. government got its main sources of income from the tariff. So it's amazing if you look how much it's shifted over time. So. Um, Land sales was huge as we were developing the West. The tariff was an enormous source of income, and alcohol and tobacco excise taxes were enormous sources of funding for the federal government. And of course, if you're going to propose banning alcohol, well, there goes that source of revenue, right? So one of the key things that takes place during the Progressive Era is this constitutional amendment to allow the national income tax, and therefore we found a replacement for the alcohol excise tax. <laughs> and uh, with that in place, that wouldn't affect 1912, I think. Um, 
now you've got this effective re, uh, re replacement for the federal government to, to fund its operations. So, Michael. Uh, Jared, I was just going to suggest uh, in response to uh, this lady's question, uh, maybe you could uh, describe George Kassel's experience after he got busted from the Senate and went to jail. Yeah. <laughs> That the question was was uh, described George Cassidy's process of going to prison um, after he got busted for the second time in 1930. So again, he, uh, this, this was during the era of the Jones 5 and 10 law, right? Um, he spent very, very little time actually in jail. Um, he basically made a promise to the judge that, that he would not bootleg again. Um, and he was, he was uh, firm with his word. So again, one of these cases where uh, throwing the book at, the, at, at someone, in fact, ended up with a plea agreement and he ended up being back out in the street again. But he didn't really spend, he spent a little bit of time in jail, but not very, very much. So a guy and then the man back here. So. Can you tell us how prevalent speakeasies were in the Washington suburbs? The question was how prevalent speakeasies were in the Washington suburbs. Um, at, during the 1920s, the, the suburbs were actually still pretty small. DC by 1930 was approaching 500,000 people in the city. Um, and Arlington, where I live, um, 1930 census, I, I just wrote an article, by the way, on, on prohibition in Arlington. It's going to come out in January for the new Arlington magazine. Um, in the 1930 census, we had uh, 30,000 people, so which doubled the population from 1920, right? So this was largely just, the suburbs were just beginning to, to grow. Um, what I found in this article in my research was that they had largely, there were plenty of lawbreakers, certainly within Arlington, but we didn't really have much of a speakeasy scene. Rather, Arlington surged because we had three big bridges. We had the um, 14th Street Bridge, we had the Key Bridge, and we had Chain Bridge. This basically formed a transit route through the county to get into the DC liquor market, right? So, <laughs> so a lot of the liquor actually came from either Baltimore, um, it came from the Appalachians, or it came from like the Great Dismal Swamp, so the south side Virginia. And it was then trucked in, and uh, frequently what would happen, they'd truck it into like, say, Aquaquan. Um, by big trucks, and then they would stop and have a transfer point where all the bootleggers um, with small, very fast cars would then take a shipment of that, and then, if you remember, like, Star Wars, all the little TIE fighters, you know, the rebels attacking the Death Star, you know, they would then race for the city in these very small, fast cars, uh, and hopefully outrunning the police and the Prohibition Bureau to, to get their, their, their liquor to market. This, by the way, this is how NASCAR is formed. This is formed by bootleggers who have these souped up cars that outrun the Prohibition Bureau. And uh, on the weekends, they get together and they race each other. And this is, you know, you think NASCAR is this thing that comes from Apple agents, right? It's tied in together with corn liquor. It really is. <laughs> yeah. What yes, sir. Is Act? What is that? Sorry? Act. What is the Volstead Act? The Volstead Act was the Prohibition Enforcement Act. Um, you had the 18th Amendment, which simply just declared that intoxicating liquors are hereby, sorry, the manufacture, sale, and transportation of intoxicating liquors are hereby now illegal. The Volstead Act is the law to enforce uh, the, the 18th Amendment. Um, this was uh, largely written by uh, Wayne Wheeler for the anti saloon League, and he put very, very strict guidelines behind it. Uh, in fact, Woodrow Wilson, who was the president at the time, who just had a stroke three weeks before, uh, vetoed the Volstead Act. He, he, he wanted intoxicating liquors to be defined essentially as distilled spirits, but he wanted beer and liquor, sorry, beer and wine still to be legal. Um, Wayne Wheeler had a completely different philosophy. He wanted anything with alcohol to be banned. He wanted effectively zero tolerance. So anything with 0.5% alcohol or higher was now illegal to manufacture, sell, or transport it. Yeah, so very, very strict um, in interpretation of, of prohibition. And again, this is with 3-2 beer um, with FDR in 1930, 1933. This is effectively their way of getting around the 18th Amendment by declaring that 3.2% beer, alcohol beer, is non-intoxicating and therefore it doesn't violate the amendments. <laughs> uh, the man here in the blue shirt had a question. Yeah, I was wondering, you mentioned uh, the African American community here. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the South, I know you want, there's quite a few African American churches that mm -hmm. frown on drinking. Mm -hmm. At least the preacher does. Yeah, especially mm -hmm. when the Baptist church, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering how did they fit into the, you know, how did those churches fit? Yeah, they, they certainly fit in quite a bit as well. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating era if you think, okay, prohibition largely coincides with the great migration of African Americans out of the Deep South. But that largely was about 1915 till 1930, um, caused in part by Jim Crow, but the big opportunity that led all these African Americans to leave was World War I. 
the, all the different jobs and munitions factories and the steel factories, and they were like, okay, let's get out of the Deep South and go somewhere where they actually want us, you know. So you had two million African Americans leave the South to, to come up north, and a great number came up here as well. Uh, we had, within D.C., we had probably the wealthiest black community in the country at the time. It wasn't as large as Harlem. You think of the 1920s as the, as the Harlem Renaissance. Um, but we had a significant middle, upper middle class and professional um, population in the city, largely centered around U Street, you know, kind of north of DuPont Circle. Um, there's a map, by the way, it shows basically where the African-American section of the city was, the, the wealthier section, which was um, kind of from Loyal Plaza all the way over to Howard University, you know. So a huge section of the city, all north DuPont Circle, that was all black. It was all built as upper middle class black. So, and, and today, of course, it's a different demographic in the city. Um, but yeah, w within the established black community, they were very anti-prohibition because they like many other people, they wanted their cocktail. At the same time, you had the Baptist ministers. You know, and the, by the way, though, that element was more the Episcopalians and Presbyterians and so on. The evangelical black ministers, on the other hand, though, were, they fit in more with the temperance movement. So yeah, the black community was quite large. It was a quarter of the city at the time. So you can't say all black people believed this or believed that, but there's really a range of opinions that take place. But certainly what we know from the historical record was that an awful lot of, of African Americans bootlegged during this time, and a lot of jazz clubs existed during this time, you know, across the U Street corridor. So it's a complex question, and I hope you'll read the chapter, um, just because it's, it's probably the chapter I'm most proud of, because it took probably the most research to go find this information, because it, it was not readily available. So. Um, woman here in the black uh, sweater. Um, I was wondering, uh, apart from customs, how did the government How did alcohol, how did the government prevent alcohol from coming into the country apart, apart from customs? Uh, not, no, not really, no. Um, <laughs> Canada was partly dry at the time, but uh, again, the, some of the big Canadians who made their money at the time was, this, was the, the Seagram family, you know, because they, um, they were bootleggers in big time. Um, <laughs> the, uh, we had plenty of ships. We had across, especially off the East Coast, we had an area also called Rum Row. We had Rum Row district in the city on, on Pennsylvania Avenue, but across the whole East Coast, outside of the first the three mile limit, and then it was extended out to the 12 mile limit was Rum Row, which was, went all the way um, from you know, Maine all the way down to Florida and then over to Texas. And that's where these big ships would anchor, right outside of the three mile limit. And then these little small ships would speed out to them every day and then off, or upload alcohol <laughs> and then speed back to the shoreline. The Coast Guard, of course, did their best to stop this, but they didn't ca capture 10% of the trade. So that's actually, by the way, not where we got most of our alcohol during that time. Most of the alcohol produced during Prohibition was uh, reconverted industrial alcohol. So, you know, go to CVS and buy denatured alcohol, right? It's denatured for a reason because it's poisonous, right? So the bootleggers figured out how you, how you renature it. <laughs> um, and then you add some flavorings to it and uh, you then put it in the containers you want to use and then you take it to the bathtub and you fill it up with water. That's why it's called bathtub gin. Because you tap you you cut it with water in the bathtub. So, <laughs> uh, Joe Kennedy involved in that? Uh, that's actually the question was Joe Kennedy was he involved? It's actually a common myth. Um, Joe Kennedy actually was not involved in the bootlegging business. Um, but I, I've I've been asked that question quite a bit. He made his money in the first half of the the twenties by shorting the stock market, and then the latter half <laughs> by becoming a Hollywood producer. Uh, but he actually was not involved in the bootlegging trade. So. Uh, there was a question here in the back. Yes. Um, did the medical and Yeah, so <laughs> I assume everybody heard the question, so, okay. <laughs> yeah, the religious exemption was one of the huge, and medical exemptions were some of the biggest loopholes that, that existed, probably the two biggest loopholes in the Volstead Act. Um, so we had plenty of people, for example, suddenly claiming that they were Jewish. You know, I'm a Jewish rabbi, my last name is Smith. And, you know, <laughs> and because Judaism does not have any kind of hierarchy, there's no pope or anything to go to, it's all basically involved out of synagogues and so on. So. I'm establishing a synagogue, and hey, I, I need to get a license so therefore I can get my wine distribution so I can therefore go sell it to my friends, you know, and so on. So, so that's, a, that's a huge loophole that takes place. Uh, the medicinal liquor one is another huge loophole that takes place in the, in the, loop, in the, um, in the Volstead Act. Um, so for example, you all know the story of Great Gatsby. That's based on George Remus, who was one of the first bootleggers. Um, and he bought up a huge number of distilleries because they had all this whiskey still 
sitting in their warehouses. They couldn't sell it. Um, and then he, at the same time, he went over and bought a whole bunch of pharmacies. And then the third leg of the stool was bribery. So he bribed all these people in the Treasury Department and the Prohibition Bureau, which was part of the Treasury Department at the time, to allow him to dispense far more alcohol than his licenses actually allowed him to do. So hand over fist, he was making just a ton of money. So really a remarkable story. Yeah, so huge exemption. <laughs> Additional questions? I know we're getting close to the top of the hour here. Well, very good. Well, thank, thank you all. Thanks so much. much. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.